Hello and welcome everyone to the video on stop signal task. In today's video, we will cover the following aspects. We start by answering the question, what is the stop signal task? We then move on to looking at how it is implemented in cognitive studies and look at the structure of the stop signal task. Following that, we study about the different variants of the stop signal task. And finally, we discern or look at the behavioral measures of the stop signal task, that is the dependent variables that we get from the stop signal task. Now, a side note here, if you are unfamiliar with the concept of dependent variables or variables in general, we do have a video in our channel specifically explaining the topic on variables and dependent variables. The link of this video will be put in the description box and pinned to the comment section or you can also find out this video by clicking on the i button on the right hand side of the screen. So without further ado, let's begin the video. Let's start by asking the question, what is the stop signal task? Now the stop signal task essentially is a cognitive paradigm that was designed to measure the prepotent response inhibition faculty. In other words, this was the most suitable paradigm for studying response inhibition in a laboratory setting. Now the origin of the development of this task can be found in the works of two key figures in the response inhibition research, namely Dr. Gordon Logan and Dr. William B. Coven. Now, in order to understand what the structure of the stop signal task is and how it is implemented in cognitive studies or why it is implemented the way it is, let us briefly tap on to the concept that this task was designed to study, that is, that of measuring prepotent response inhibition. So response inhibition can be defined as the ability to withhold, cancel or postpone a prepotent goal irrelevant action. In the context of the stop signal task, we specifically study the action cancellation aspect of response inhibition. In other words, this task tests or taps into studying the ability of inhibiting or stopping a response that was already initiated. Let's understand this with an example from everyday life. Now, imagine an everyday situation when you're driving on the road. When driving, a common experience is coming across traffic signals and crossings. Now, imagine a situation in which you're driving in good speed and then come across a green light, which then turns into red after a while. The best and the safest thing to do in such a situation is to hit the brakes immediately. Now, this action that you undertake by hitting the brake in response to the red light when you are in the driving mode employs the faculty of response inhibition, abilities of action cancellation. This is the faculty that the stop signal task essentially taps on, measures and studies. So now that we have a good understanding of what the stop signal task tests and measures, Let's proceed to see how it is implemented in cognitive studies that use it. Now, the stop signal task essentially has two different types of tasks within it. It has a go task component, also referred to as the primary task sometimes, and it has a stop task component. Now, note that in such cognitive paradigms such as the stop signal task, the participants are usually sat in a room or a computer lab with access to a computer screen and a keyboard. They are then given instructions about what the task is, what they have to do, which keys they have to press, etc. So we will follow a schematic that tries to instantiate a cognitive task undertaken in such a setting. Let's now move on. In the Go Choice Reaction task, also referred to as the primary task, the participants first see a Go cue or a stimuli. In this schematic, the Go cue is a green arrow. This is a typically used go queue, but there could be other go queues used as well, which can depend based on the research question of interest. So once the go queue appears, the participant has to press a button on the keyboard based on the appropriate direction of the arrow, just as shown in the schematic here. Once the response is recorded, the participant then proceeds to the next trial and the go task continues and so on and so forth. Let's now look at the stop component of this task. Now, in the stop component of the task, the participant comes across a stop signal, 
which could be an auditory cue, such as a beep sound, or a visual cue on the computer screen, such as a cross, as shown in the schematic here. Note that the stop signal appears after a certain amount of delay post the presentation of the go cue. Now, once the stop signal appears, the participants have to cancel their action, which in this case would be aborting pressing a button because the presentation of the stop signal has rendered pressing the button as a goal irrelevant act as the current goal is now stopping the action. Do you see any similarities with the traffic signal example that we studied about before? Post a comment below and let me know. So that essentially wraps up the structure of the stop signal task. However, an interesting question that you might be thinking about is when, that is after how long, is the stop signal presented and how often is it presented? All good questions. Let's find out. So the stop signal is introduced in a variable delay and is usually referred to as the stop signal delay or SSD for short. So in this schematic, we see that for one of the stop trials, the stop signal delay or SSD occurred at about 100 milliseconds. In the next trial, at 200 milliseconds, then at 350 milliseconds and so on and so forth. Now, note that in some studies, the SSD can be fixed. That is, it can be presented at fixed delays. So they could either occur at about 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 300 and so on and so forth. However, caveat of using fixed delays is that it can interfere with the dependent variables of interest. Let's unpack that a little bit. If there is a fixed SSD, then it is possible that the participants would predict when the stop signal will be presented. Now, this could impact their behavioral strategy in the task and they could wait for the stop signal to appear in order to inhibit, thereby tampering with their true performance in the task. Thus, it is recommended that a broad range of SSDs are presented. This is achieved by continuously adapting and adjusting the SSDs using a dynamic tracking algorithm for standard adaptive tracking procedures. Let's see what happens in the adaptive tracking procedures with a schematic. Imagine that you're presented with a go queue and then presented with the SSD at a delay of about 100 milliseconds. Let's assume you appropriately inhibited your prepotent goal irrelevant response in this stop trial. The dynamic tracking algorithm in response to the correct response you made on this trial will increase the SSD by 50 milliseconds. Thus, in the next stop trial, the SSD will now be presented at a delay of about 150 milliseconds, and so on. Now, if the participant makes an error, then the dynamic tracking algorithm will reduce the SSD by 50 milliseconds. So, if the SSD in the last stop trial was about 350 milliseconds, and the participant failed to successfully inhibit the stop trial, the next stop trial will be at 300 milliseconds, and so on and so forth. This thus reduces the predictability in the stop trials, a caveat we observed in the fixed SSD studies, and enables us to account for accurate response inhibition performance of the participants. Now note that the SSD decreases on all unsuccessful trials, such as those that include premature responses, choice errors, and so on. Moving on, Let's try to answer the question how often the stop signal is presented. Now, usually, if we consider that the total number of trials is about 100%, typically 75% of the trials are Go trials or the Go component of the task, and about 25% of the trials are stop trials. Although a typical trial distribution, this could differ across different studies based on different research questions, different participant pools, and so on. Let us now move on to understanding how the SSD impacts one's inhibition performance. Now, evidently, the presentation of the variable delay of stop signals casts an impact on the response inhibition performance. 
and thus it is an important aspect that is accounted for in the experiments that use stop signal tasks as also in the theoretical frameworks and computational models of response inhibition. With the help of a schematic, let's look at the impact that this variable SSD can cast on response inhibition performance. Imagine again that you're presented with a go queue and after about a 100 millisecond delay, the stop signal appears. It is much likely that with this shorter SSD, you will be able to successfully inhibit because the stop signal was presented much closer to the presentation of the go queue. As a result of this, you were not ready yet to initiate a response and thus it was easier for you to inhibit. Now imagine being presented with a stop signal at a greater delay, say about 350 milliseconds. It is likely that you will have an unsuccessful inhibition in this particular trial. This is because presenting the stop signal at a greater delay in turn means that the go queue is present on the screen for a much longer time. This in turn initiates the go response and you are in the response execution phase instead of the response inhibition phase. Great. So with that, let's briefly look at the different variants of the stop signal task in the next part of the video. So what are the different variants of the stop signal task? This type of variant is usually referred to as the modified stop signal task or MSST for short. In this version, as we can see in this schematic, we simply use a specific type of go queue based on the research question of interest. Now, an established body of research exists at the intersection of cognitive psychology, cognitive and computational neuroscience that studies the impact of rewarding and appetitive go cues such as chocolates as shown in the schematic or alcohol etc on one's response inhibition performance. Now in such studies, the MSST variants are used. Note that other than the type of go queue used, everything else pertaining to the structure of the task, the aspects pertaining to SSD, task implementation, everything else remains absolutely the same, such as the classic task that we studied in the previous part of the video. Let's now move on to the last part of the video wherein we study about the key behavioral measures or dependent variables that we obtain from the stop signal task. In this video, we will look at three key dependent variables or behavioral measures typically accounted for, analyzed and studied in the research studies that use the stop signal task. The first one is the go reaction time the second pertains to the stop signal reaction time and the third pertains to the probability of signal respond. Of course, there are other measures that are accounted for based on the research question of interest, but these are the most typical measures that are accounted for. Let's briefly look at each of these measures. So the first is the go reaction time. In simple words, the reaction time that is accounted for all the go trials from the go component of the task plus also the signal respond reaction times which is the reaction times from the stop task when the participant has an unsuccessful stop trial comprises of the go reaction time distribution here i have simulated on a computer program a typical go reaction time distribution which quite closely matches the empirical distributions that one would obtain in a research study with human or animal participants Definitely, there can be differences in the participant to participant performance and thus the distribution could be different. But usually a positive right skew distribution shape is what is typically accounted for in the go reaction time distribution. Let's now move on to the next key behavioral measure of interest, which is the probability of signal respond across the stop signal delays. Now the probability of signal respond essentially accounts for the probability that a participant will respond despite the presentation of the stop signal as shown in the schematic here. Theoretically, as the stop signal delay increases, the probability that an unsuccessful inhibition will be made will increase as well. 
as we can see in this presented simulated data. We can also observe from the simulation that two participants have different probabilities of signal response for the same SSD. These are the kind of differences that are interesting to researchers who study response inhibition using the stop signal paradigm. Let's move on to the final key behavioral measure of interest, which is the stop signal reaction time. The stop signal reaction time is one of the most important behavioral measures that is accounted by any study that uses the stop signal task. It is one of the key measures that has solely made the stop signal task a putative cognitive paradigm in the response inhibition research. Now, in a future video, we will dive much deeper in studying about the SSRT in detail, such as how it is calculated, how it's estimated, what the computational frameworks of SSRT are, and so on. But in this video, we focus on getting just a working understanding of it. So the SSRTs or the stop signal reaction time refers to the duration of the stop process that is the time at which the stop process terminates relative to the presentation of the stop signal. This time is unobservable because no response is emitted on successfully inhibited stop trials and SSRTs are also accounted across specific SSDs. All right. So if you have made it this far in the video, I have a fun bonus for you. Why not try taking part in a stop signal task yourself? Here is a link for you to play around with the actual real-time stop signal task. This task demonstration can be found at the scitoolkit.org website. So let's take a moment to thank the creators of this particular demonstration at the scitoolkit.org. Kindly note that the Brain Cyclopedia team has not developed this demo task. I have added the link of this site in the description below as also pinned it to the comment section. Have a go at it and get some hands-on experience with the stop signal demo. This will also help you consolidate what you have learned today in this video. As always, thank you for watching and see you in our next video.